Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Again, thank you that we've had a chance to assemble. Thank you for the people of God everywhere. May we step into who you've called us to be. May we step into our calling. May we step into our destiny. We say yes and amen to everything you've spoken over us, Lord. And we pray that this time will be yours in every way and that you'll have your way in this place and as it goes out over the airwaves, in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. I'm going to look at the picture. A decree for far off, way over yonder. That's cool. I like Kevin's pictures. So, a decree for far off. And you might guess it's from Acts, right? We're still doing Pentecost. Um, the anchor is uh, Acts 2.39. Some of you know Acts 2.38 really, really well. But there is a verse after that and before that, right? So, <laughs> a decree for far off, Acts 2.39 is from the NIV. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Amen. So here we go. Here we go. Ready to roll? Here we go. Luke 24, 49, we've uh, looked at this over the past couple of sermons. I'm going to send you what my father's promised. So there's this promise, and Jesus says he's going to send what God has promised, what his father's promised. But stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So stay, have a seat, take a load off, stay, hang around, stick, Velcro, Stay in this place, stay in this city till you receive the promise. Remember to receive, just take it, just take it. There you go, that's receive. So uh, being clothed with power, that's garments that are like, you just can just fall into, they're just like, they're the good clothes you like to wear when you're comfortable, you know. The stretchy pants and the old sweats and stuff. Um, clothed with power, dunamis, and this power is going to come from him and not us because we've got something inside us that gives us a new inherent might and ability and strength. But stick, stick in the city until you receive what the Father's promised. And I love the way it's worded there because the Father has promised, but Jesus will send. They work together. The Father's promise Jesus sins. The promise comes through Jesus. The promise is accomplished through and by and for Jesus. So, um, so that's where we're heading. So from Luke 24, 49, and all this is after the resurrection. I didn't go before the resurrection. I just stay in after the resurrection. So Acts chapter 1, verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, and I told y'all, when we talked about that in detail, that that's like this unusual sort of word where he's like gathered them together, assembled them together, and it's like they're, uh, they're spending time together. Even, even the idea of lodging and spending days together kind of thing, like they've assembled. And so uh, one of the things I said after the resurrection, I call it pop-up Jesus, but just because I say pop up Jesus, just because he shows up and disappears doesn't mean that there's not lengths of time with him while he's popped up, you know. And so this, the very wording, it's the only time it's worded this way in the New Testament, gives this indication that they're not just eating this meal, but he's, he's gathered them together and there's a length of time and maybe even several days and during that conversation, and it, it tells us clearly that after the resurrection, he speaks a lot about the kingdom of God. Uh, he says, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. So there it is again. Did I? Did I? Yes, I did. Okay, I want to make sure. <laughs> wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. So again, it's the father's promise. And Jesus has talked to them about that promise already. And so we'll just go on to Acts 1-5. For John baptized with water, 
but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he's, he's beginning to let them know. And he's talked to them about it before. They know what the promise is, but that the promise is the Spirit. So skipping to Acts 1.8, but you'll receive power. He talks about they'll receive power. They'll be clothed with power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, that's what's going to change because inherently we only have human strength and human power, human ability. But when the Holy Spirit comes and he'll, he'll, he'll be in them, they will have his inherent strength and ability. And so it will change things. And then you'll be my witnesses, my testifiers in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost. In other words, there's going to be this uh, fanning out from Jerusalem. First, you're going to take Jerusalem. Uh, you know, many times we talk about the Jews were unbelievers, but, you know, the first, the first Christian church is Jerusalem, the first Christian church of Jerusalem. And there are thousands upon thousands and, uh, and thousands of Christians in Jerusalem when the persecution begins and they start fanning out all over the world. But they ultimately turn the world upside down, the report is. Um, so all that's review. So here's where we're starting new today. Acts chapter 2. All that was setting up. The promise is that same Greek word for promise, like an announcement sort of for information, uh, possibly uh, a, a pledge, a, um, a uh, what is it? How did it word it? Something for divine goodness. I'm going to have to do this just to make sure. I don't want to tell you anything wrong. Uh, especially a divine assurance of good, a scent, a pledge, a message, and then promise good or blessing. I like that, uh, that this promise is a divine assurance of good, a divine assurance of good, and talking about the Holy Spirit. So the Father and the Son are going to make sure they get the Spirit of God to make them like Him. Uh, sometimes we forget Jesus is fully human and fully divine. But the way he worked that out on earth was he lived as a human being that had the Holy Spirit without measure. And so he lived as a human being anointed. He was the anointed one by the Spirit of God. And so he lived in that anointing and he only said what he heard his father say only did what he saw his father do. So his ministry was wonderful words and wonderful deeds that were powered by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay. And, and so now he's going to give them the Holy Spirit so that they can be fully human and fully divine. So that they can be people, regular people, humans but anointed by the holy spirit so that they can hear the voice of god and see the deeds of god so that they can only say what the father says and only do what the father does so that they have wonderful words and wonderful deeds yeah. like jesus did and it's not a junior holy spirit for them compared to the holy spirit that was on jesus because there's only one holy spirit one Father, one Son, one Holy Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit will be on them. He said, it's better for you that I go because the Spirit's going to come and he'll be with you constantly. Can't always physically be in my presence, but he'll be with you constantly. And so you'll have me with you all the time, constantly abiding. And you'll have the opportunity to do greater things greater things uh, I think the Greek word there is mega and it's greater greater uh, there's that place um, you know there's a, a place where it talks about Peter or Paul and maybe both uh, as it's going through because it it starts off talking about uh, the disciples and specifically Peter 
and then transitions to Paul as it goes through because it starts off in Jerusalem and then spreads out in the countryside and Samaria and then switches to Paul as it goes to the uttermost. And that's Acts, and it's, it's Acts of the Apostles, but you could say it's the Acts of Peter and Paul, or really you could say it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's the one fueling it all. And it's the same Holy Spirit regardless of the person involved. You get to Philip, and Philip has the same Holy Spirit that Peter has had or that Paul will have. And Philip has that all of a sudden. He's over one place and then another place kind of thing. And it's the Holy Spirit doing these things. So, back to this. The day of Pentecost came they were all together in one place suddenly it sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven filled the whole house where they were sitting it's Pentecost pilgrims come from all over the world uh, Jewish men are required to be I'm sure that there were ways that you could have a hall pass get somebody to sign your your excuse or something but basically Jewish men were required to show up for Passover Pentecost and Tabernacles. And so this is, this is one. Everybody was there for Passover. A lot of people stayed for Pentecost 50 days later. Uh, some went back home, depending on where they were, and came back again for Pentecost. So the city is full of people. Last time it was full of people, Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And the city was chaotic. And so now people are back and this one's going to be different. When you look at Jewish history, Passover is when they left Egypt. Pentecost is where they were at Sinai. And God came down in fire on the top of Sinai. And one man went up because they didn't want to meet with God. You go meet for us. So one man went up into the fire looked like a furnace on top. Joshua went halfway and waited for him, and everybody else stayed down below. On that day, it says, some of your translation says thunders. The word is actually voices. They heard God speaking. And in the voices, Jewish tradition is, that there were 70 voices because it says when God speaks, it's not just for the Jews, it's for all the nations. And Jewish tradition, according to Genesis, was there were 70 nations, so 70 voices. When you look at Jesus sending out the disciples two by two, first he sends them out just the 12, the tribes of Israel. The second time he sends out 70. It's like this shadow in advance that this is going to be for all nations. There's, there's all kinds of little tips and clues like that along the way. But Pentecost commemorates Revelation. The Torah or the Ten Commandments or the Old Covenant came on Sinai to Moses written by the finger of God on stone tablets. <coughs> When Pentecost fully comes, the new covenant kicks in. Jeremiah 31 is quoted in Hebrews 8. The finger of God writes his word on men's hearts. Fire comes down in a pillar, divides and spreads. Some people think the tongues of fire only went to the 12 because Matthias has now taken Judas' place. But it appears to me that it goes to all 120. And that they're all speaking in voices, dialects of those who are assembled in Jerusalem so that a commotion begins. There's a violent wind, rushing wind. A violent rushing wind is much like a shofar blast and it assembles Pippity dippity, all hands on deck. It assembles people, it calls attention, and people see tongues of fire or pillars. Remember in the wilderness during that time, they were led by a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. 
It's a pillar of fire. It represents the presence of God. Pillar of fire comes down, divides, goes over the whole 120, I think. I think they were in the temple. The word here for house is a word that can refer to the temple. Uh, if you look, some of you like the Passion, if you look in the footnotes of the Passion, the Aramaic is worded in a way that it could mean the temple. I think that this was not done with them hidden away somewhere. Luke has told us very clearly they're continually at the temple. If they've been continually at the temple for the last 10 days since Jesus ascended, why would they not be at the temple on the feast day when you're supposed to assemble? They'd be at the temple. He would not hide what he was doing. He did it at his house. His house. How could 3,000, actually more, because 3,000 are the ones who believed, there were more thousands than that assembled in the street of Jerusalem around some house where it's taking place in an upper room where you can't even see them. It's at the temple. They're at the temple on feast day. Nine o'clock is the time of prayer. Peter's about to say, it's only nine o'clock. It's the time of prayer on a feast day where everybody's supposed to assemble at the temple. There's a rushing mighty wind. The Ruach HaKadosh, right? The holy wind, the holy breath of God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Hippity, pip, uh, pippity, dippity, not hippity, dippity. That's a Disney song, probably. So uh, people's attention are there. They see the pillar of fire. They know what that's about. They're there commemorating. The pillar of fire splits in. It's on these 120, and they start speaking voices. And what they're speaking is the mighty wonders of God, the wonderful deeds of God. At God's house. It's amazing. So, it says on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost, the one that happened in the desert with Moses was pre-shadowing this one. This is the real day of Pentecost. This is the fulfillment of everything they've celebrated for centuries. Their celebrations have been wrapped up in this fulfillment here. They left Egypt, they left bondage, they left slavery, and at Sinai they became a nation. A nation was born and a covenant was given. Jesus took us out of bondage, and at Pentecost, the full Pentecost, after the full Passover, a nation was born. An ecclesia was born, a kingdom was born with a new covenant, a new constitution. Yes. So there's a rushing violent wind, loud noise, filled the whole house, the whole temple area where they were sitting. There were places you could sit on the steps, places you could sit in the colonnade. You could even get meeting rooms at the temple where you could meet. So, let's go to the next one, because I'll get ahead of myself, because I just like talking about it. So, Acts 2, 3, and 4. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Jesus had breathed on the disciples. They already had the Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit. This is a new thing with the Holy Spirit. This is a separate thing with the Holy Spirit. This is, this is something he was talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had received the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you're going to be baptized. Just like when you bapti baptize people in pickle juice, excuse me, just like when you baptize people in water and the, the reference that we know what it's about is pushing them under till they bubble, totally immersing them till their character is changed, taking a cucumber, immersing it in vinegar so that when it comes up, it's a pickle. The nature has changed. 
That's what baptism is about. When we're baptized into Christ, we go down a sinner and we come up a saint. We may not feel different, but we go down with sin on us. And our character and nature is changed and we come up a new creation and sin has no hold on us. And because sin has no hold on us, we're now available for the presence of God to live in us. Because sin separates us. So when we walk down in the water and we're going down, we're separated from God. But once we go under and come back up, there's room for God to dwell. Because we've been separated from sin instead of separated from God. So he says there's coming a time. He just told him, we just read it. You're going to be pushed under the Holy Spirit. You've got the Holy Spirit, but you're going to be totally flooded, immersed, overwhelmed in the Holy Spirit. You're going to be different. You're going to be able to do different stuff. Because the Spirit is going to enable you empower you you'll be able to do more than you could do in your own power you'll be able to do in his power good good i'm glad you agree that's good acts 2 14 we'll just skip over so all these people you know what's happening from from there to here is all these people assemble they see all this stuff happening they're hearing their own voice they're saying what is this? We're hearing our own dialects, and we know those Galileans don't know all our languages. And, and if you see, some of you have maps in your Bibles, and you can see it'll show you Jerusalem, and it'll show you the Roman Empire, and you'll see all these arrows. Every place that's represented, how it's, it's showing a, 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 what, an illustration of how all those people named have come from all over the Roman Empire to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And they're hearing, they all knew Aramaic, they all knew Hebrew, they probably all knew Greek, but they're hearing it in their home dialects, whatever they speak where they're from. They're hearing it, and it's getting their attention. I've, I've been overseas and heard somebody speaking English got my attention, right? In the midst of all the voices, hear the English. I can be somewhere, and I can hear Spanish, and I know it's Spanish, and I get a word or two and stuff like that. Even my lack of familiarity with Spanish, although I used to be a little bit better with it, 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 it will catch my ear. So imagine being somewhere where they don't speak English, and you hear somebody speaking English, you know? So, so Peter stands up with the 11, so he separates, that's another reason I think it's the whole 120, because all of a sudden they sort of come and it's just about them, and he raises his voice and addresses the crowd, fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you, listen carefully to what I say. Remember how he was given the keys to the kingdom? On this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. It's a big boulder, big cliff, but you're a little rock. You said it. So you're going to get the keys to the kingdom. So Peter is unlocking the door and opening it up. So first of all, some people, besides being amazed, just assumed evidently there were other things going on besides just the manifestation of the different languages. Uh, I don't know if, if some of y'all have been places where people stagger around and fall down and stuff like that, and they ha had no alcohol or drugs. It's just God shows up in his weighty presence, and it becomes a lot easier to just lay down. Some of you may have experienced that. Apparently, some of that kind of stuff was going on with the 122 because one of the accusations for those who are there is they're drunk. There's a party going on, and they're drunk. I don't know about the fire and all that, kind of, but 
Those folks are drunk. They're just way too happy. And he says, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. It's time for morning prayer. Time for morning prayer. Uh, I've read somewhere that on feast days that people didn't typically eat till after morning prayer. So that may be something else he's saying. It's only nine o'clock. We hadn't had anything. We fasted, like all y'all, till after morning prayer, because it's Pentecost. I don't know if he's saying that or not, but he's letting them know. It would be totally inappropriate for us to have had anything, and that is not what you're seeing. Instead, what you're seeing is what Joel talked about. And so, uh, Acts 2.17 in the last days, and we've talked about this before, Peter says, on the birthday of the church, these are the last days. Former days are the old covenant. The new covenant has come, and so now we're in the last days. Because we saw Jesus go up, and then two guys said, just like you saw him go, go up, he's coming back. And he talked a lot about coming back. So we're in the last days. We're between the time he went up and the time he's coming back. <laughs> it's the last days. And here's the new constitution for these last days. So he says, Joel said, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. That's another reason I think it was all 120 of them. I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Joel continues saying, uh, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And he goes on from there. I'll skip down to verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter says very clearly, these are the days we're now living in. What you're seeing now is a display. In fact, one of the things that I left out was how the sun would be darkened. Look in your scriptures and see if it's in there. They had seen that the day Jesus was crucified. There had been darkness. From noon till three o'clock, there had been darkness. So, so there's this thing that Joel says that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord is going to be poured out. And the interesting thing is, since God is eternal and infinite, you can't pour him out out. There's always more of him to go. So you just keep pouring, right? It never empties. It keeps pouring. There is no Maxwell House good to the last drop because there is no last drop. There's a continuous abundance. An infinite supply. Inexhaustible supply. And the Spirit of the Lord was being poured out on all flesh. And he talks about generations, moms and dads and sons and daughters and men and women. Yeah, the women get to play too. So, we're going to find out in another place, not only the men and the women, all the women, yeah, but the Jews and the Gentiles, what? The dogs, yeah, the Gentiles are going to get to play too. And not just, and then, you know, the Gentiles are going, yay. And not just the men and the women and the Jews and the Gentiles, but slaves and free. What? <laughs> yeah, slaves and free. This party's for everybody. Party's for everybody. Everybody matters. It's for everybody. It's what Jesus has done. For the joy set before him because he loved humanity. Because he loved everybody. Because everybody 
was fearfully and wonderfully made, knitted together in their mother's womb, given the breath of life by him. Every living being made in the image of God was worthy in his eyes of his atonement. He wanted to make all things new. Another thing that's happening here is it's a shout out to Babel. Because men in man's strength wanted to do craziness. And so he divided their tongues so that they dispersed and became nations. And now he's uniting their tongue with the tongue of the Lord to create a nation to unify by the power of his spirit that would now enable citizens of this new realm. Everyone, everywhere, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, slave, free, everyone, everywhere who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved because that's what he's all about. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It's for everybody, everywhere, for all time. I'm going to skip some verses. It's got a lot of good stuff in there, but I'm just skipping to get to some other stuff. So Acts 2.33 is talking about Jesus. He was exalted. So we've got, here's sort of what we call the kerygma in Acts. It's, It's a pattern for sermons. Jesus came in fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus ministered, did wonderful deeds, spoke wonderful words. Jesus was crucified, died an atoning death. Jesus was resurrected, and Jesus was exalted to the right hand of the Father. So this is where the exaltation's coming in. He's saying exalted to the right hand of God. He's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Remember, he said, you're going to receive what the Father has promised, I'm going to send him to you. So Jesus, because he's been exalted, because he finished the work. Let me just, let me just take a moment there. I mentioned a while ago, he cried finished before he died. We, we have this idea that Jesus did the atonement through his death, which is true. But I want you to know for sure this. He's on the cross. He says it's finished. The debt is paid. The sin of history from the first person, Adam, to the last person, the last person, the last person, whoever that person is, the sin of accumulated humanity was less than his righteousness. His righteousness was greater. And the atonement started at the garden where he sweat drops of blood. We could get into that and, and, and talk about what took place at the garden. For him to sweat drops of blood, he started off with his own stuff because he was half human and he knew what he was about to go through. And he was also half God. He also knew that besides the human cruelty he was about to endure, the weight of sin would be on him, the weight of the curse. He knew what that was spiritually as well. And he struggled for a moment. And he was victorious in the garden. And then began the atonement for us. And went all the way through till he said, it's finished. In Greek, it's paid in full. A lot of people think that he didn't actually say the Greek. He said what the Hebrew equivalent is, and the Hebrew equivalent means paid in full. (laughs) Paid in full. He exhausted sin and death and hell in the grave while he was still alive. And because his righteousness was greater than our sin, 
He could have hung there forever because he could not die. Because he was a sinless life who had exhausted all the sin of humanity, and he was still alive. He had to bow his head and give up his life. Or it wouldn't have gone, because no man could take it from him. Because he was a sinless life that had exhausted sin and was still alive. That's amazing. So he gave himself up. He did some fun stuff that I won't get into right now. Came back and did a lot of fun stuff, freaking people out. I would just love that. I'd love to just show up and go, hey, what's happening? No, don't get down there. Come on, get up here with me. Oh, you fell again. <laughs> here, let me help you. It's a good thing I want Jesus. There'd be a lot of play and mess going on. So. But I have a feeling there was anyway. We just can't get it off. So, so, exalted to the right hand of God, he's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. So if you didn't know what the promise was before, even though Jesus has spelled it out, he's saying clearly the promise, the promise that we're receiving today is the Holy Spirit. Now they already had the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them after the resurrection. He breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit, but they've gotten this other thing with the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit has come into them and upon them in a way to now produce the kind of power that only God can produce. So, He's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and now Jesus is pouring out what you now see and hear. So what you see, the pillar of fire dividing 120 flames of fire on 120 people, and the sound of the rushing mighty wind, and the sound of the voices, it's Jesus pouring out his Spirit, like Joel said, would happen. That's what's happening right now. You go on from there and you'll get to a verse called Acts 2.38 that many of you know by heart. Repent and be baptized. It's right after they've been cut to the core because Peter doesn't hold anything back. Now, this is the same Peter that a little servant girl said, yeah, you were with him, I saw you. No, and cursed and said he didn't know Jesus. Three times. The same Peter is now on the Temple Mount preaching to thousands of people with the people who were responsible for Jesus' death right there, with Roman soldiers right there. And he is not only preaching and saying, This is what Joel said, but he's saying, You killed him. You killed your Messiah. You killed God. He ain't holding it back, boy. He's all over it. And the people are cut to their quick. They're pierced. Some of your translations say this, this word pierced them. Now, one reason it pierced them was because it was enabled or empowered by the Holy Spirit. It was anointed. You just don't go around saying stuff like that if the Lord hadn't told you to say it. That's, that's how you know when Jesus calls the Pharisees a bunch of vipers, it's, it's empowered by the Holy Spirit because he, he didn't do that till things just got all the way. By the time he does that, that's the only thing that can pierce their hearts of stone. It's not something you just say. It's not something you preach all the time. But when the Holy Spirit's preaching it, you give voice to it, right? So they say, hey, what are we to do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's all wrapped up in Jesus' name. They get baptized all the time. 
they baptized themselves to be up there. That morning they baptized themselves to be up on the Temple Mount. Baptistries all around the temple. Again, if 3,000 get baptized in Jerusalem, they, they got to be at the temple because they got baptistries everywhere made for thousands of pilgrims. So repent and be baptized. Change your mind. You may have been part of the people who were saying, crucify, crucify. Change your mind. He's your Messiah. He's your God. Change your mind. Change your direction. Be baptized. Be immersed. Go down a sinner. Come up a saint because your nature has changed in the water. And you now are able to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That, uh, that's, something, that's something I baptized people for a long time without ever really thinking. Well, what does that mean? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It, it, I mean, it doesn't change any of the people I baptized. They're still baptized. But uh, it is interesting to actually think about that. And some of you... Some of you have heard that. The name of the Father is Yahweh, but in the Old Testament they wouldn't say Yahweh. They didn't want to take the name of the Lord God in vain. So what they said in the Old Testament was Adonai, which means Lord. The name of the Son is easy, Jesus. We know his name. I mean, some of you might want to go, well, his name is Yeshua. Well, yeah, it is. But in our language, for most of us, to know who you're talking about is Jesus. And then in the name of the Spirit, what's the name of the Spirit? Well, the Spirit anoints. So Messiah or Christos, only the the Spirit can anoint and make you an anointed one. So the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the embodiment of the unseen God. When you've seen him, you've seen the Father and the Spirit. You ever have a question about what the Holy Spirit will do or what God will do? Go look at Jesus. Jesus. Because you see the express image of the Godhead in Jesus. I'd like to park it there for a little bit, but I should go on. So I'm going to skip, like I say, skipping 238 to get to 239. The promises for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So let's just play with this for a second. Now, I've, I've given you... Four examples, I think it is, four or five examples of the promise. And uh, let me just put my glasses on, just refer to them real quick. So in Luke 24, I'm going to send you what my father promised. Acts chapter 1, wait for the gift my father promised. You've heard me speak about, and then gets on down, talks about the promise, and Peter's very clear, it's the Holy Spirit, and then he says, and many times when you hear people preach on this, the promise, they're talking about the repent and be baptized and the gift of the Holy Spirit, but the context of the promise, the thread of the promise is about the Holy Spirit, but of course if you receive the Holy Spirit, you've been saved because it's the salvation that makes room for the Holy Spirit. Because if you're not saved, sin separates you from God, right? So sin separates you from the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But once you receive Christ, once you become a believer, and uh, not everybody has been baptized in water, but we like to baptize people in water because they baptize people in water. And, and we push them under till they bubble. <laughs> like to do that too. Um, Barry's here, right? Can I tell about JT? Yeah. JT, Barry's dad, uh, was 
Do you have any idea how old he was when he got baptized? He was what? 57. I knew it was in his 50s, but I didn't know where. 57 years old, and he, he let me baptize him. And what made it tricky was he had had a tracheotomy. Is that what you call it? Yeah, tracheotomy. So he had a covering here, and, and we, <laughs> we used to love it. He had this deep voice before he had that. And so it was sort of funny because he was a big guy. Once he started talking with the pipe, and I, I don't want to out Barry or anything, but Barry and his brother used to like imitate him. <laughs> I could probably say Barry talked like the pipe and Barry could do it right now probably. <laughs> could you? I'm not going to ask you to, but could you? Yeah, yes, you could. <laughs> I was wondering. Yeah, you probably could. But, but he... He wanted me to baptize him, and that's, that's sort of a, you know, if you've had a tracheotomy, you're, you're concerned about that. And he told me, he said, look, if I start fighting you, you don't even mind it. You push me under. I was like, I, Jackie, I just don't know. <laughs> he said, I'm serious. Look, I want to go under. I don't know if he said that in front of y'all or not. I can't remember if we were alone, but it's what he told me. We're out in the baptistry, and like everything's cool. We start going down, and his eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger, and I was like, uh oh. <laughs> I heard my ear. He said, push me under. I said, boom. <laughs> got back up, hoping he was okay. <laughs> and he was. he was. He was tickled, wasn't he, Barry? He was tickled. We talked later about that. I said, I saw your eyes. He said, I know. I know. I know you did. <laughs> I know you did. But he was glad to go under and come up because he came up different. Amen. He came up different. He felt the difference. And people saw the difference. Because when we go under, or when we accept the Lord, there's a change that takes place. The sin that has ruled our life is removed. And the God we were separated from enters. And we're different. Everything's changed. Everything has changed. So this promise of the Holy Spirit Peter says, you've seen this tongue of fire on us 120, and you've seen this, this, uh, this thing take place with these tongues of fire. You've heard the rushing mighty wind. You've heard us speak in your language, and you've been pierced in your heart by this message. I want you to know that what's taken place here is Jesus has been pouring out his spirit on us, and the promise that has manifested in your presence and you're now witnesses of, this promise is for you. For everybody who hears him. For the thousands. There were 3,000 who were saved, so there had to be plenty of people who weren't. So the thousands that heard him, this promise of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God uniting with you and indwelling you, this promise is for all of you. And he doesn't stop there. And your children. Now, now, some of them may have had their children with them, but it was no need to say your children if it were with them because he had already said to all of you, so everybody who, who witnessed. So it had to be children in the sense of those not here. This promise that you're bearing witness of today is not only for you, but it's for your children. Just like Joel, fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, generations. And for all who are far off. Now, far off, there are some people who think that's about the Gentiles. So 
So like there were people there from all over the empire, the Roman Empire, that this promise was not just for those people in Jerusalem hearing it and witnessing it and their children, but it was for the entire empire, all who are far off, which I think is true. But because it's generational, I think it's also all the children who are afar off for every generation because the supply will not diminish. The supply will not be exhausted. The supply will be continuous. And so this promise that we've received and that's manifested in front of you is for you and for your children, most of whom probably didn't exist yet children. Some, some children maybe were at home, but there were children to be born, promises for them. To all who are far off, you actually have to take it almost out of context. He has been talking about you and your children, which is a generational thing. So that makes it seem like the primary meaning there is you and your children and generations are far off. But I, I'm sure it was not just you here at the temple, but people out there as well. It's for everybody. So today, I want to tell you what you already know. The Holy Spirit is for you. The Spirit of the Lord is for you. There's a pouring out the Lord wants to do for you. Maybe you've received the Holy Spirit. Maybe you were baptized. You got the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just like the disciples had the Holy Spirit. But have you been deluged? Some of you like to say deluged with the Holy Spirit. Have you been overwhelmed by the Spirit of God? Have you been filled up so much that you can feel it breaking forth and overflowing all around you? Have you been embraced by the Holy Spirit so that things that bother you disappear? Have you been encompassed about with the Spirit of God so that nothing else matters in that moment at all? The, the pouring out is a continuous supply. When you go through the New Testament, it talks about be, be filled with the Holy Spirit, which doesn't mean you weren't filled to start with, but it means you need a continual filling. Just like there's a continual pouring out, there's a continual filling. I need the Holy Spirit on the inside for me, and I need the Holy Spirit pouring out on me for the people around me. I, I need the stuff to change on the inside of me that's Danny's junk, but I need that power on me. I need to be clothed in that power to minister to others. I need the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my character, and I need the gifts of the Holy Spirit to let people know that God is love and he wants to intervene in their lives in powerful ways. The promise is for us. The promise that took place on Pentecost, when Pentecost had fully come, it had fully come as far as, in my, in my understanding, it had fully come as far as Moses to Jesus. But I will say this, I don't think Pentecost has fully come from Jesus to Jesus. In other words, I think Jesus finishes stronger than he starts. I think a resurrection is a lot more powerful display than a virgin birth, but a virgin birth is miraculous. There's no denying. That's, I mean, that's, 
It's miraculous. But to be beaten to a pulp, hung on a tree publicly for humiliation, and then show back up in a couple of days, that's outstanding. Undeniable outstanding. Virgin birth is according to Mary's testimony. Joseph took it on faith. Mary knew it to be true. Joseph took it on faith. Mary knew it to be true. Everybody else takes it on faith. Mary knew it was true. The resurrection, oh, bunches and bunches and bunches and bunches of people know it to be true. The rest of us take it on faith. But, you know, it lists all those people who saw him, over 500 at one time. So, Pentecost, there's been this constant pouring, but there's coming a manifestation of the promise that's beyond any manifestation so far. And the promise is for you. The promise is for you. Promises for you. But it's going to take people who want it. People who desire it. It's, it's going to take people who worship Jesus. People who are filled with a static joy and are praising God and praying constantly and who are doing what he said to do. Like stick tight till he comes. Whatever that word is, they're doing what they've been told to do and they're doing it with joy yeah. and they're worshiping Jesus yeah. right. and they're praising God yeah. in his house continually and praying constantly. There were over 500 at one time who saw Jesus but there were only 120 that got the tongues of fire. I don't know where everybody else was. Might happen on a Sunday you don't show. <laughs> That'd be a shame, wouldn't it? Spend all that time, be a part, and then decide, nah, I can do remote today. <laughs> then you're watching the video on Tuesday and you go, what? <laughs> so. The promise is yours. Do you want the promise? Do you want the promise? It's God's promise. And Jesus is pouring out his spirit. And it's for you to change the world. Pick it up. Just take it. Praise team can go ahead and come up. If you don't know the Lord, please talk to Angie or me or somebody. Love to introduce you. I'd love to push you under to your bubble. <laughs> I love it. I also like to watch other people do it because it's, it's such a blessing. So lots of time if there's somebody who's been pivotal and somebody coming to the Lord and then they bring them to me because they feel like they've got to have a preacher to do the baptizing, I usually say, don't, don't you want to do it? And they go, can I? Well, yes, you can. <laughs> I'll help you with the words. And it's just the most awesome experience for somebody to be baptized by the person who led them to the Lord and for the person who led them to the Lord to get to baptize them. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience to baptize your children. Baptize Johanna on a center block. 
she had to stand on a center block so they could see her out of the baptistry. She stood on a center block. I baptized her. It's cool. It's really cool. So I'm going to close a prayer, but my prayer of closing is on the uh, Lord's Supper as well. So uh, let's stand. Lord, as so many sermons and acts say, you came here in fulfillment of Scripture. You did wonderful deeds and you said wonderful words. You lived a sinless life and you died an atoning death on our behalf. And you were raised on the third day and you were seen by many and you ascended and you're now exalted at the right hand of the Father for you make constant intercession for us and we have received the gift from the Father given by you your Holy Spirit and we praise you as we eat this bread we're aware of what you did for us physically and that by your stripes we were healed and as we drink from the cup, we're aware that this fruit of the vine represents your blood, the blood of an innocent life that now redeems us and makes us new. Though our sin was as scarlet, we are now white as snow. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for your compassion and mercy. Thank you for your grace. And meet with us as we eat and drink. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.